grants less. Uh, so I thought when I, this job popped up at our studio, I thought it was a great opportunity for me to get to teach people who are not students. So that is people who need to learn the R skills that they need to be able to do a job better. So I get to now interact with more adult learners. Um, I was previously teaching many uh, graduate students back at OHSU. So it was still a lot of, it was an age mix but a lot of people in PhD programs or master's programs. And now I get to interact with people from all kinds of different walks and from people with people with all kinds of different industry backgrounds. Um, and, uh, and it's definitely different teaching challenges and it's been really fun. And it also gives me the chance at our studio to be able to funnel those teaching challenges back into actually making the software tools themselves better. So the things that I teach, I try to make better after um, I teach them. So we're always uh, having like that constant feedback loop so that we can improve APIs um, so we can, you know, get rid of errors that we run into that are weird, that are edge cases. Um, so that's really what, um, what excites me the most about my current position is being able to do that and then also being able to mentor uh, new educators who want to go out there and uh, do it classroom by classroom or workshop by workshop uh, because we at our studio cannot uh, do all of that. Uh, we're really interested in trying to empower um, educators and try to make their lives easier by creating as much content as we can that's reusable uh, using our own tools so that people don't have to start over from scratch. Is that long enough? I think it was five minutes. Yeah, that was great. That's, that's great. <laughs> that's enough. Um, <laughs> I'll let Katie go ahead next. Sure. Um, so my name is Katie Fitzgerald. I am a fifth year PhD student in, in statistics at Northwestern. Um, and I recently accepted a job as an assistant professor of statistics at Azusa Pacific University out in California. So that's where I'll be uh, really launching my teaching career um, next fall. Um, I do work in um, statistical methods for social policy kind of broadly. Um, I do a lot of work in uh, data visualization. So R is definitely my friend in that regard. Um, as far as, you know, why do I love teaching? Um, I went to a liberal arts university in undergrad, um, which was really kind of transformative for me, it kind of helping me develop holistically as a thinker, as a scholar, as a person. Um, and so I knew kind of early on that I wanted to uh, return to a liberal arts university for a career. And so that's actually why I pursued a, a PhD in the first place. Um, but being at Northwestern, I feel like I really kind of uh, developed a passion for statistics education in particular. Um, and I think this is a really exciting time to be in, in stats and data science education. Um, you know, we, we're all living in this world where there's a plethora of, of data and evidence out there. And uh, statistics obviously is a really powerful tool to kind of help make sense of all that information. Um, and so kind of my, my mantra as a, a stats educator is I think that um, stats education is really an opportunity to, to teach and to learn how to be better stewards of information. Um, I think we need more people that are thoughtful producers and consumers of, of data and, and evidence. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's really kind of where my heart is at in terms of stats education. Um, but uh, in terms of, you know, like I said, I, I'm kind of going to be launching my, <laughs> my teaching career next year. But I think uh, the reason Abby um, invited me here tonight is because I was part of the team that helped to redo the Northwestern intro stats curriculum. So about a year ago, um, two faculty mentors and myself uh, revamped that um, intro course to kind of make it a very um, heavily R based course um, where students, regardless of their background or their major, uh, they're coming in and, and learning R and the tidyverse in a, in a 10 week quarter. Um, so yeah, happy to kind of talk more about that um, experience and in developing that curriculum. But that's where I'll stop for now. Thanks. And then our uh, final panelist, uh, Marinia. Oh, I was just saying, um, I'm annoying, so I have slides, and they're also so that I um, keep on task and don't go off on a tangent, which I've been known to do. Um, so thank you for your patience. Um, you guys can see that, okay? Okay, so here, let me actually go to the beginning. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm Marinia. I'm a health geographer slash spatial epi slash spatial data science at UChicago. I'm a senior lecturer there, um, so I teach and do research. I explore how place impacts, interacts with and drives health. So I use 
are in my research. Um, and so just because people, some people like visual stuff. So here are just different maps I've done in the past, but also kind of statistical analyses using R. Um, and so from like kernel density analyses to spatial social networks, um, I use R a lot. And then my job is also to teach students and other people how to do that. So um, all, all the courses that I teach that include R, um, there's no programming requirement. So I can have students who've been using R or different programming languages for years, or I can have someone who's brand new. Um, so here's just kind of a, a smattering of those courses. Um, and then I also, through different kind of grant projects, develop toolkits to kind of customize an intro to R for GIS and spatial analysis things um, to those communities. So, um, and I can share this link out. We just did one for opioid uh, research. Um, so looking at how neighborhoods, um, you know, why does, why does opioid epidemic happen more in some neighborhoods and other neighborhoods? And as you can imagine, the same thing is happening with COVID. So um, how do we get programming setups to be able to do that kind of complex research? Um, then I also do a little bit of peer mentoring. So um, on the one hand, I'll teach students, um, some students who are hardcore perfectionists at UChicago who have not experienced making a lot of mistakes before or <laughs> are to pin their studies. And then they hit my class and they're making mistakes all the time. And that's really frustrating for them, but that's actually really exciting. But I also will teach um, you know, clinical health researchers who might be at the top of their field um, and then my job is to kind of show them how little they know about both GIS and maybe certain types of art on coding pieces. So it's interesting how people are the same no matter where you are in life. Um, so yeah, so doing that. My favorite part about teaching, and I can touch on some of this during the Q&A, but I love troubleshooting. I make students install everything on their own. We actually include time in class for troubleshooting. And like I spent a little bit of time talking about like how do we search for things to troubleshoot? Um, how do we use Google search and like the algorithms within that to help us um, for a lot of students, both R and GIS or spatial analysis are both new to them. So there's a lot of um, pits of despair moments, <laughs> a lot of aha moments. And a big part of this is like teaching people that sucking at things is actually normal and it's a good thing <laughs> and, it, um, and it gets better, right? So um, mistakes are part of learning and I really love um, that process. I think maybe there is kind of a hate love thing because the students are hating it while they're going through it. But then I love seeing that, um, yeah, <laughs> they, they always make it to the other side. Um, and then why are, I'll include, I mean, so I tell the students at the beginning too that if anyone asks you, you know, what's better, R or Python, you always answer C and you leave it at that. And that either means the C language is better, which probably is, because <laughs> it is a lot more faster and more efficient, or it means that it just depends on what you prefer. So I use R in our courses because learning the basics are really fast and doable. Like we might not actually be teaching how to program in the classic computer science sense, but we're learning how to use R um, quickly to, to get stuff done. And, and it, a lot, it, it has that kind of capability to do the bare bone basics, which I really like. Um, in GIS and spatial analysis research, when you're making maps, you can also make maps using a lot of other software um, like ArcGIS. ArcGIS is at least $10,000 uh, for a license, um, which is pretty unaffordable if you're in a community organization or even a, um, a you know public, uh, public entity. So um, I think that it's also kind of a a very cost effective, meaningful thing. You're shifting funds and sort of to software to the people who um, can do more stuff with different things. So, and then also there's like specific reasons within um, the GIS world where I really like what R has done with the spatial landscape a little bit better than Python um, for now. <laughs> and there's just a lot more communities in R that are active in the space than other languages. So um, that's something else that's exciting. So like, I don't know if you guys remember Opera, that was an operating, or that was a web browser that was really popular. Uh, well, it was popular with a few nerds because it was a really elegant, very good, you know, it hit all the marks, but nobody used it. So it kind of died, right? So, I mean, with R, like, yes, there may be challenges in some ways, but to me, it's more important that there's a really strong community behind it. And that also helps a lot um, for troubleshooting and that sort of thing. So that's my piece. 
Great, thank you guys so much. Um, so this is really great. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start um, the, the panel and um, yeah, we don't, don't feel obligated to, to answer every question. If one or two of you wants to answer, it's fine. But um, yeah, so uh, the first question we have is, um, what are the big skills you anticipate students taking away from your respective courses you teach? I can go. <laughs> um, I think for me, uh, one of the bigger focuses that I have now um, in teaching people uh, sort of outside of an academic classroom is I want to be able to teach people to solve their own problems um, so they know what is the uh, tool that I'm using, what are the underlying things that could go wrong, and how do I get myself out of this if I get stuck. Um, because what I really don't want is to give someone some kind of like sanitized experience that's wonderful and then they leave my workshop or they leave you know the time with me and then they're totally trapped um, because as opposed to an academic classroom there's no lifeline left once I'm gone I'm gone um, so I really try to instill um, some basic troubleshooting um, but when I did teach uh, like data visualization for example I put a pretty strong focus on teaching uh, what one of our um, guest lectures with Stephen Few, who you may be familiar with from data visualization. Um, and one of my favorite things that he talked about was data sense making. And I feel like that's a really, really important uh, concept that we often skim over because it's so easy to just start getting into the R stuff and what you can do. Um, and his whole focus was on like thinking sometimes, you know, what is the kind of question that I want to answer? Does the data that I have even help me answer that question? Like, can I even make a visualization here that's worth <laughs> consuming? Um, so I really tried to instill uh, that in my students. Um, and more currently, I'm kind of sort of grappling with the challenge of uh, teaching a lot of HTML based tools when HTML fluency is not something that we're all uh, taught in uh, common educational circumstances leading up to a job where you're probably going to have to deal with HTML output <laughs> at some point. So uh, that's kind of one of my bigger challenges right now is I teach a lot of parts of a toolkit that sort of depend on an underlying framework of HTML fluency and how do I build that in uh, when I'm teaching people so that it's not all just magic. I want them to understand a little bit about why it looks like magic. I can go. Uh, I would echo a lot of what Allison has said. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's regardless of what career a student ends up pursuing, like they're going to come across data, right? And so it, for me, it's, it's important to get them to the point where they can, um, they can make sense of their of their own data and kind of like let their own curiosity drive them to solve the problems that they are going to encounter and that they're interested in finding solutions to. Um, so things like just making sure they can read in a data set and uh, clean it, wrangle it, visualize it, um, and kind of glean some insight from it. So I think like practically that's probably uh, the, the biggest thing that I would uh, hope that they'd be able to do. Um, and again, kind of using that as um, really helping them um, recognize the power of data, because I feel like most, just like the general public, their eyes will just glaze over when they see data or a data set and have no idea what to do with that. And I think a lot of information gets lost um, in that regard and, and people aren't able to, to harness it, uh, to use it. Um, to make informed decisions. Um, so really kind of equipping them with the skills that they can do that in wherever they, they go moving forward. Um, and then I think from the statistical perspective, um, we kind of call statistics the science of uncertainty. Um, and so I think uh, really trying to get them comfortable engaging with uncertainty. And that's something that humans, we don't like to do. We would prefer things to be certain, um, but I think our, offers like some really nice pedagogical opportunities to, to get their hands dirty with simulations, for example, and kind of see the ideas of randomness at play um, in ways that has not been possible in kind of traditional stats courses. So that's another piece that I definitely emphasize in, in courses is, is the uncertainty piece and really getting their hands dirty with seeing randomness in action. So yeah, similarly echoing <laughs> everything that was said previously. And from a lot of the court, like the, the kind of learning environments where I'm working from, it's also really important to spend a lot of time in framing the research question. So R is not something, or I mean, I think any coding language, you're never going to memorize all of the parameter functions. Like that's just not, I mean, maybe there's a few functions that you use a lot, 
Um, but like I used, you know, read.csv for a really long time and then I switched to a different package and it's something different now, right? So I think that um, there's not one way to do things. There's actually an infinite number of ways and then you can also change it and create a new way. So it's, it's, it's a very different way of thinking. Um, so, so yeah, one of my goals is like, think about like what, what, what's the research question that you have? What, what do you want to do first? And like really iron that out. And that's actually a really big task. And then from there, then figure out what, um, what functions do you want to do? And then kind of, you know, pull, pull, pull those out of your toolbox. So I try to give like students or learners kind of a smattering or like these are different tools that you might commonly use. Sometimes I'll actually add bugs to labs on purpose, sometimes not on purpose, sometimes on purpose. <laughs> um, so that like, it's really funny the first time that happens because someone will be like, oh, there's, there's, you know, something's not working here. And I'll be like, you know what, you're right. What do you think that is? And they'll like, there's a little bit of a resistance of like, well, shouldn't you know, you know, like you're, you know, you're, you're, you're the teacher or you're my lifeline. You're supposed to, you're supposed to resolve these things for me, right? Um, and so initially there's a resistance when I push that back. I'm like, well, I don't know. Let, let's sit here until someone figures it out. And then let's go through all the troubleshooting pieces. Uh, I think that kind of flipping is, is really important. And, and I mean, otherwise you can't be successful if you can't do coding outside of your class, right? Then it's gonna be that one traumatic class that um, you try to avoid <laughs> for the rest of your life. Great, yeah. Um, so I know we talked a little bit about um, like the idea of tools and tools, I think a lot of <laughs> you have used it to kind of say it's like a line of thinking, a line of questioning and inquiry um, as you learn, but practically what for, for the course, specifically for the courses you've, you've taught and have experience with, what are your favorite R related resources and um, like course materials, um, things like that? Like, what do you think works best? I can go. Um, maybe I'll uh, screen share real quick. Can I do that? Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Share. Um, so uh, I made the education site for our studio, which is a collection of things that I think are great learning resources for people. Um, we had our uh, one of my interns uh, two summers ago, Desiree DeLeon, who now works at our studio with me. Um, she designed all the custom artwork here. Uh, so you can climb Nacho Mountain for beginners. Um, and this link will take you to, you know, this is kind of like, I guess, uh, my answer to all the people, especially once I joined our studio who are like, hey, I've always wanted to learn R, where do I start? These are like six links, six kind of things that we think are the best places to get started. Um, and fun really fact, uh, data driven, <laughs> this is the most visited uh, page on this website. Like week after week, it blows everything else on this website out of the water and all other R Studio <laughs> links as well <laughs> across the board. So beginners is a popular one, um, but there are also, um, some suggestions for intermediates. So if you're ever kind of like feeling like, well, I'm not a beginner, but I wanna know what are the latest resources, we do keep this up to date. Um, and then there's also a page for experts as well, um, kind of giving you um, links to kind of the latest like versions of advanced R since it's being updated. So we try to link out when there's a development version of things. Um, and for teachers, we also have a teach section that has um, some pointers to how to learn to teach, but also materials for teaching is extremely helpful and tools for teaching. So the tools for teaching kind of describes like infrastructure and ways to use it for teaching, but materials links you out to a bunch of our um, uh, developed workshops and courses that we have. So uh, those are some of my favorite resources uh, to share with people. And I made it basically because I was getting inundated with <laughs> questions all the time and on Twitter, and it's just so much easier to have a link, uh, which is part of uh, what I think is awesome about having more HTML fluency is it's always easier once you have a link to just be able to share it and it scales really well. It's amazing. Um, other than that, I do have um, some like links on my website to projects that I've worked on um, that uh, I think are pretty good um, and uh, teach data visualization and some other concepts. But also I think STAT545 is a resource developed by Jenny Bryan. Um, and it was one of the first things that I worked on at our studio to port it over to a book down website. Um, and I think that's a really great place to send new learners as well. Um, so those are my plugs. That was pretty awesome. Um, 
<laughs> also, yeah, I, the, just an, an FYI for everyone, um, Allison has, speaking of HTML fluency and, and blog down, um, she has some really good materials about like building your own personal website with Hugo and all of that. So um, yeah. And I'll give a spoiler that we're, like, we're about to do giant upgrades to all of this documentation. So like, in the next like three months or so, there'll be a whole new R Markdown website and a lot of new learning materials. So uh, related to blog down as well. And we're making some big changes to make it more usable and more user-friendly, so. Very cool. Katie? Yeah, so um, I'll share a link here. Um, I love anything that Mina Chitankaya Rundell puts out. Um, I think she might have held a, a similar role to you, Allison, at our studio. She's currently um, at uh, Duke um, and and the University of Edinburgh, um, and so she she's uh, very uh, good with developing pedagogy. Um, and she has a pretty much all of her course material is available on her GitHub um, and any like talks that she gives or anything is all um, available on her GitHub. So I'll, I'll send that link as well. Um, but she has a few courses that are fully um, available. She has something called data science in a box. Um, that's kind of a, an intro data science course that I very much um, am planning to rely heavily on as I <laughs> step into to new roles there. Um, and so, yeah, I think anything anything by her is excellent. Um, and then, if anyone is in need of a of an intro stats course using the Tidyverse, I'm happy to share our uh, our materials that we used. Uh, we have kind of an open source textbook uh, to go along with that as well. All right, and I'm. Let's see, I have my video on and off because my Wi Fi is ebbing and flowing. Um, so it's interesting because, like, for the stuff that we do, we're kind of expecting people to on ramp very quickly. So I'll share a lot of resources. Some of the resources were shared here already at the very beginning, like even before the class starts. But otherwise, I'm, I've become a really big fan of like learning by like different applications or scenarios, right? So, like, here's a problem. Um, what would we have to figure out how to, you know, what packages we'd have to gr grab, what would we have to learn in order to, to solve it in R? And there hasn't, I, I found that there's not as much resources in that kind of piece. Um, so we've been starting to create more um, kind of application specific things around that. So like here's a toolkit we just did with a um, it's not it's not technically NIH, it's NIDA, which is within NIH and they get mad if you you know, call them NIH, but they're not technically NIH. <laughs> um, but we just created this like a toolkit that was basically for those who already knew a little bit of R, um, but wanted to scale up, um, but kind of presenting it that way. And, um, but for example, we're going to be doing this same toolkit for a GIS audience next Monday. Um, and that's going to be a very different tone because they'll they'll already know GIS, but they'll be really afraid of R, right? So we're kind of working in this almost like niche space where um, there's still there's still a little bit of a gap in um, there's there's a lot I mean that being said I, I'm you all you probably all know Angela Lee <laughs> she was um, really active um, in our ladies and, and also from you Chicago um, or she was one of my um, yeah she, she worked on some of my projects as well um, but she so she's de developed a lot of really excellent um, like intro to spatial analysis um, tutorials as well. Um, but again, it seems like if you're learning R and you're learning, or if, if you're learning spatial analysis, um, oftentimes um, there needs to be a little bit more information about how we use things and why we, you know, why we do them and so on and so forth. So, um, so yeah, that's the tricky part, but we're still working on it. Um, and that being said, my favorite text is in, for this, for these topics is Geocomputation in R um, by Lovelace and some other guys, um, Nova, um, Jakub. Um, and some other guys um, that's usually set up as an introduction, but I actually use that for my advanced course because um, it takes a while to really figure out why to use certain functions and when to use them and that sort of thing. So, so it's tricky. Um, I think the more applied you, you get, it can get pretty tricky. Awesome. Um, so, so what tends to be, um, the part of your your class your course or a workshop that you taught that you find students enjoy the most and then uh what exactly do you think they struggle with the most i know we talked about just like 
being wrong <laughs> and having to work to work through that. But um, if you have any like particular things for the material you teach that enjoy and do not enjoy. Um, I can say that one thing that kind of has surprised me recently is how much, like, especially with remote education becoming, um, you know, more normal, um, and we're all kind of doing this over Zoom all the time. Um, I'm finding that students like having a little bit of time where it's just kind of like uh, free time to ask questions. So I often do like breakout rooms where I kind of pop into smaller breakout rooms and can talk to people. Um, and that seems like that's kind of a little bit of a relief. Um, I think it's really hard with remote education now to feel like you're respecting people's time though also. So I'm, I try to be really conscious of that. So I think like right now it's just kind of, it's hard um, doing any kind of education. Um, I feel like uh, things are just kind of breaking my heart left and right. Like I hear people saying they can't go into their team's breakout room because they've got their four-year-old behind them and you know it's climbing on their back and they don't want to turn on their video so they don't feel like they can bring down their whole group. And so it's just, it's, it's kind of a, a tough time, I think, for everybody. And, and that's kind of a different, um, a different flavor of hard than I've experienced before as an educator because it's like everybody's going through their own kind of personal awful circumstances and everyone's is different and it's really hard to anticipate what's hard uh, for people right now but I can assume that anytime I'm asking people to give up their time it's hard um, you just don't know what's going on with them um, uh, what I think people enjoy a lot also is um, being able to watch somebody live code and that's really hard to make time for um, and I would probably rewrite this article differently, but Greg Wilson and I, um, with two other colleagues, published an article recently about participatory live coding and how to do it. And it was sort of right before the pandemic. So now it's it's like kind of a different, different thing to do live coding when you're remote also, it's kind of odd. Um, but I find that that's kind of easier. Um, it's, it's kind of fun. Um, it, it's kind of a nice way to connect with people, even though you feel like it's weird because it's all screen. Um, so I think those are I, sort of, pandemic highs and lows, which I don't know if they really count as highs, but. <laughs> yeah, plus, plus one for live coding. Um, any class I've TA'd for, people really appreciate getting, watching, watching you make mistakes, watching you think through like, okay, how do I fix this? So I, I, I totally get that. Yeah, and it takes some of the pressure off. Um, I, I don't like feel, making people feel like they go into a breakout room and they've got this like blank slate in front of them and they're supposed to fill it in with code. That's, that's really hard. Yeah, I would say I think uh, students really love the data visualization piece. They get pretty impressed with themselves, I think, when they can uh, create these, you know, pretty fancy visualizations that they've only seen um, in the business world or in marketing or, or whatever. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think they have a lot of fun with that. Um, one thing that I've found that uh, people have enjoyed is um, it it makes it really easy, particularly in the online setting. But um, if you have a Google form that you can like live survey them essentially and kind of get some like live data. And then um, the Google Sheets has a um, feature where you can publish to a CSV. And so you can just get a link to then send that link out. And the, the students all then have access to this like live data in a very quick turnaround um, and you don't have to deal with file paths or anything like that. Um, so it's a pretty convenient um, thing and they I, I think they, they tend to enjoy that particularly because it's um, they're working with data that's relevant to them because they just produced that data um, just a few moments before. Um, so I, I've, yeah, I've seen that activity. Um, uh, people enjoy that. I would echo I think the, the biggest challenge is um, anxiety. <laughs> it's kind of like a terrifying mix of math anxiety and coding anxiety. Um, but I think a, a couple things that help with that, um, which we've kind of already alluded to, one is just like to name it <laughs> and normalize it. Um, and, you know, I think programming is a great way to kind of foster a, a growth mindset. Um, because like we've talked about, errors are inherently part of the process, even for experts. Um, and I think that process of like getting error messages and trying to diagnose a problem and coming up with a plan to fix it, um, that's like the same type of mindset that you want to foster in, in learners in general. Um, it, instead of just like totally freaking out and shutting down when something's wrong, but actually using it as a diagnostic tool to figure out like and pinpoint where the misunderstanding is, where the problem is. So I think it's actually a really valuable and transferable skill. Um, and then the other piece that I think helps with anxiety is um, to kind of, you know, ideally 
from a pedagogical perspective, you want to use tools that have a low floor and a high ceiling, right? And so to teach in such a way that you make the floor as low as possible. Um, so one of the things that we did in, in our course was that um, we used our markdown documents for all of their in-class activities. So they start with a, a knittable document at the beginning of class on day one, where they can you know, just click the button and they've all of a sudden produced a, an HTML document from their own computer. Um, and so uh, the woman that I mentioned earlier, Mina, she kind of has a, a, a nice talk that um, basically is making the point. The title of the talk is Let Them Eat Cake. Um, and so kind of like let them do the fun, exciting things first. And so they can kind of get to see what's possible um, and then go, go back and make them deal with the, you know, the, the wrangling and, and all the cleaning that's kind of the nitty gritty stuff that we get frustrated with, but really give them um, some insight into like the power of what they could do with these things. And then I think that gives them a little more motivation to, to push through the push through the anxiety and, and all the errors. I'm going to steal that from one of my classes, Katie. I love that. <laughs> um, I'd almost, so another thing that maybe um, that has come up in classes that is kind of unexpected is the, the question of authorship. So, um, so I, like when I'm doing my, when I'm doing my work, there's a lot of copying and pasting, right? So this is a snippet from this stack exchange that works. So I'm going to integrate that and then look at five other, you know, posts or documentations and kind of piece things together. Um, and I've learned, or as I develop a better, like, relationship with students, eventually they're like, how can you do that? You're just plagiarizing all over the place. Um, and I'm, I'm like, no, 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 that's actually what the part of it is like, no, that's what we're all doing. But then that's not the right answer either, right? But it's just such a different way of doing science or, you know, doing knowledge production, like it's a shared collaborative work that is not something um, yeah, so on the one hand, there's kind of like, well, uh, and so for me with live coding, even that can be a challenge because I really like when I'm coding, I really type things out letter by letter. Like I take this chunk from something I did last week and I copy and paste it and I switch out the name, right? So do I live, do I type everything or, you know, or do I just copy and paste? Like I still kind of struggle with that, <laughs> like when to do which piece. Um, so I think that that's something that, um, yeah, similarly, I don't know if there's a really good way to kind of communicate that. I feel like we like the every time this comes up in the class, we kind of just talk it out and it, it makes sense in the end, <laughs> I think. But um, just, you know, how does knowledge production work? How do, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about open source um, workflows and licenses and how important it is to cite, you know, even if you did pull a snippet from somewhere else, you can actually you know, when in doubt, just add kind of an introduction or comment out some code <laughs> at the beginning. Uh, but that, that's, a, that's a kind of a fascinating topic that um, seems to be getting more interest over the past few years, um, which is kind of unexpected. Cool. So this might be a weighty question. I don't know, but the big uh, base R versus tidy verse divide. Um, someone submitted a question like, do we teach uh, tidyverse first. Um, yeah, if you could just talk a little bit about your personal philosophy on that. I shall wait in. Um, <laughs> I, I, I hate this argument so much. I don't know how you teach tidyverse without teaching any base R. Uh, I, I really don't know how. Like, I don't know how you teach anything to do with mutate if you don't know mean, min, max, median. Like, I, I don't know how you get through if you don't know your basic arithmetic operators like you know equals in those things, how do you know how to filter anything. Um, I, I feel like it's a complete false dichotomy and um, I feel like use what makes you happy and what you can explain to other people when you're teaching. Um, and uh, I always think back, I think David Robinson had a really great blog post a few years ago that was like he, he judges uh, what he wants to teach with by the number of times he has to say I'm sorry to students. So the number of times you have to be like, oh, oh, no, wait, I'm sorry, this, this thing goes this way, or oh, no, wait, I'm sorry, the argument is this, but, but there's a period in between the two words instead of the camel case for this other one, like, I, that's, that's what drives me. And that's why I generally taught with, you know, tidy verse first, but I always teach them, like, if you look in um, uh, my website, I have a data visualization course where I did this, where at the beginning of every lecture, I'd talk about like base R and tidy verse are two peas in a pod. Here's what you need to know from base R to be able to use these tidyverse functions effectively, because otherwise you're just holding a mutate and you have no idea what to do with that. Um, so I, I personally feel like it's trumped up and it's meant to divide people. And I also feel like it's, it's a, 
it tends to feel a little, I, I see it on both sides, I understand, um, but it also tends to feel a little um, uh, controversial where there's actually no controversy. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I, I feel like I'm, I am done <laughs> with that, <laughs> that argument. So I will leave my stake in the ground there. <laughs> So I'll say we kind of took the, the team tidyverse approach in our revamp of the Northwestern curriculum. But actually, I do appreciate that more nuanced perspective because I think you're right. Uh, it's it's not an either or. Um, and I, in fact, we actually, I think the first time around kind of underestimated the amount of base R that they would need to use the tidyverse well. Um, so in particular, like with filter, we realized that they had no, and part of this was just like logic, but they had no understanding of how to put together um, and and or, um, you know, statements to be able to filter the way that they were wanting to. So I think, yeah, you have to have both. Um, but I do think the tidyverse offers some pedagogical um, advantages in terms of like the pipe function, for example, I think is really helpful in kind of breaking it down into more digestible pieces. Um, I think it's easier to kind of read um, like you would a sentence. Um, so I think there are some pieces that are more intuitive in, in that way. Um, and I think from a data viz perspective, like ggplot is just, you, you can't beat it. And again, from a pedagogical perspective, the um, uh, really like the grammar of graphics and being able to kind of teach that as a language, I think is, is really valuable. Um, Katie, I'm just going to go ahead because I think this fits well here. Someone asked on the Google form, especially for you, that they had um, a lot of their stats classes taught in base R, like specifically stats functions in R are more reliant on, on base R uh, instead of tidyverse. So they're curious how exactly um, you felt like that was integrated in your intro course. Yeah, and one of the things, um, kind of as the course went on, we did realize that like it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to to like just strictly be team tidyverse all the time because there are things that are just much um, more straightforward to do in base R, and a lot of the the stats functions um, are are just better and and easier, um, and it, you don't have to really think through like how to get this into a tidy format and all of that. Um, and so I think yeah, I think particularly for some of those statistical analyses, base R is actually the way to go and it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's, it's very helpful or not, but I would say, yeah, we definitely uh, echoing Allison here that I think it's a both and. And this is a big issue in spatial stats too. So in addition to base R versus tidyverse, there's two competing frameworks, SP, which was the old way, like akin to base R, um, R and then now SF, which is tidyverse friendly. And um, in a lot of, but, but not everyone in the spatial community has shifted to the new framework. So, so what I find is like, if you, if you only teach tidyverse um, and suddenly you want to do point pattern analysis, none of the data structures, like the, it's a different data structure, right? And how you call data is different. Um, so it's not compatible. Um, and, you know, yes, you could just switch everything to the older format, but it's still not quite like it's hard. It gets harder to resolve errors if, if you don't understand the logic behind it. Um, so I end up doing this kind of hybrid, you know, um, you know, we'll mainly learn tidyverse, but then sometimes we'll kind of take a step back um, to, to rewind and do a little bit of R or the, the base R pieces. Um, but it's 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 a lot for people to take in. I think that's a challenge. If you're a learner, it, it like the competing um, data structures and how packages work, right? How packages can actually support <laughs> different data structures. It, it, it can be it can be pretty tricky. Yeah, and then it doesn't help that the communities can be very competitive with each other, right? And then there's like the data table folks, um, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, well, thank you guys. That was really great. We have, yeah, a couple questions that have been submitted through the Google form. So I'm gonna just go through those. Um, so I feel like I definitely know Allison's answer to this, but I'm curious for the other two panelists answers. Do you get more requests to teach than you're able or willing to accommodate? How do you choose what to say yes to? <laughs> well, so my approach lately has been to develop more, I, I think, okay, so the first answer is yes. <laughs> Definitely the, 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 the need is much higher or the demand is much higher than the supply of um, 
teachers and that sort of thing. But I, I also think it's partly the materials, right? You have to like know enough about how to hunt online to find the different materials. Um, it's not like, like people have asked me like, isn't there just a textbook that you recommend? Um, and you know, any textbook that exists will immediately be outdated. Um, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, but I, I think that having better learning resources that are more like standardized. So like, I think that the projects that Allison, that you, you guys, or our studio have been working on is, are, are excellent. Um, but then I can imagine that, well, that could also get competitive, right? Um, with other groups who think that they're creating their own education series at um, like the data camps or, or whatnot, right? Um, but yeah. And saying no, I, yeah, that's, I just, I, I've learned to, to get grants and then write in develop toolkit into a grant um, and then hire people to help develop that. So that's, that's been my latest strategy, <laughs> put it into the budget. I can say that when I was at uh, Oregon Holden Science University, I did exactly what um, you just described. Uh, I, when I got to the level where I was the PI on grants, I budgeted for it so that I'd be able to make time for it. So I had like a budget line for dissemination um, and training. Uh, and I made sure that I was able to train people on my teams and that I was able to kind of pay it forward at my institution too. So I really tried to find structural ways to make sure that what I was doing wasn't volunteer training or teaching, but that it was like not just going to get paid, but also like recognized by my organization so that when promotion and tenure time came up, I didn't feel like I had donated my time and my energy to something that didn't help me out um, in the end. So I, I really was very conscious of that when I was um, on a promotion and tenure track to make sure that that was never, um, never volunteered. Um, all right, I'm gonna, Katie, do you have an, any thoughts or should I go to the ne next one? Okay. <laughs> all right, so this one, um, how do you engage with or encourage people who've had a piecemeal experience with R and they come away frustrated and they come to you? Now what? Well, that's how I learned. So I feel like lucky that people actually get to take classes <laughs> so so part of it is that is like you know welcome to the club i hear your frustration and you know <laughs> and that part of it um but the other part too is like you can't learn everything at once right so like like i like in in exchanges like that the question really becomes like well what are you trying to do like what what excites you the most are you trying to make a really cool visualization do you want to dive into the statistics um do you want to are you trying to build a product? Like, do you want to create a, an app, like a web application for your portfolio? Are you trying to do some research for um, an article, right? So if you just want to run some stats, you know, maybe you don't need to learn all the all the other stuff. Um, and just getting a couple snippets um, of what other people have done will be enough. I think that's that's really powerful um, and that's typically what I would do too is try to find out like what were they trying to do because most people if they embark on the journey of oh I want to learn R you're not going to be successful because there's no way you're going to learn all of R I don't feel like I know I've learned R. <laughs> I know how to do things in R um, and I can do certain things in specific subsets, but I don't like feel like I know R. Like multiple times a day, somebody slacks me a message with code and I'm like, I have no clue what that does. You know, there's just like, there's all these rough edges that I have no clue because I've never needed to use them for my job. So I think most people have had bad ex a mismatch of bad experience and not totally um, uh, they didn't know the space that they needed to be in to be successful. So there's kind of that mismatch that happens. Um, and typically, it, I think like workshops and webinars kind of get a little bit of a bad rap, but I often think that that's like a great way to get somebody to deliver for you a mental model, essentially, because like what you were lacking probably was a mental model to start with of the space that you needed to learn. And even if you don't get a workshop that's great, or even if you don't get one that has even, even hands on anything, I feel like it gives you the vocabulary to be able to figure out like, okay, I totally didn't understand this, but I really, and I need to know how to do this for my job. So I need to find resources that help me with this. Because if you're just looking for like 
our resources and searching randomly, you're, you're just going to have darts going everywhere. And it's yeah, be, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think a lot of it is is learning how to Google effective, like what the language is behind it. I 100% agree. Yeah. So if you can like do like a quick workshop, like if you can find somebody who's doing a webinar or, you know, a quick workshop that's especially now that things are remote, there's so many wonderful remote workshops that people are offering. Um, and you can often find them on YouTube if you missed them live. Uh, I think that's kind of really powerful for helping people just figure out like, what's the, what's the landscape that I need to learn? In a lang like a la the languages metaphor is also really powerful. This doesn't work if you're working with a group that only like that have never tried to learn a different language before, but like, I'll get, I'll share the story where like, you know, I tried to learn Spanish. I've been in Spanish classes since I was in junior high and high school and even part of college and I could barely speak, right? It was this total piecemeal, you know, experience. But then when I actually went to countries where Spanish was spoken and was forced to do that um, on a, on a daily basis and make a million mistakes and embarrass myself, but then have the community like, you know, support me. I learned within two weeks what took me like 10 years to, to piece together. Um, and that for some reason, like especially for um, ESL learners, they're like, oh yeah, like, hey, like I can already speak two or three languages, which is more than my teacher can. So <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe um, the struggle is, is, is like not that, not that different, you know. Yeah, I would, I would echo all of that and, and just kind of make the point that like, I think we're all saying that like the, the best way to learn is to do and that's like how it happens in real life. So I'd say that we should take that mindset and bring it into the classroom as well. Like, why do we think that we need to teach the in the classroom in this very just like traditional structured way? Um, but we should actually leverage that, that like people actually learn best when they're um, needing those skills to do something um, that they that they want to do and that they want to find the answer to. Um, and so, yeah, just a plug for like real life data, answering real questions. That's going to be really the motivator to get them to to learn these things. Thank you guys. Um, I think we have time for like one or two more final questions. Is that okay? All right. Um, so someone asked um, about like the virtual setup. I think Allison talked a little bit about, um, yeah, the virtual environment and kind of what, what is, um, what is kind of the hardest or most uh, unexpected online R teaching um, situation you've encountered recently and um, how'd you over overcome it? I don't know that it's unexpected <laughs> because it's totally expected, but it's the tech problems. It's like you set up like everything ahead of time, you test it, you're like, okay, I like my husband has a Windows machine, I'm gonna go test it over there. You can test everything and then you get in there and things fail or even things fail on my setup that like just I it drives me bonkers um and I think that's just kind of one of those things that in remote setups can feel a little um I don't know for some reason more scary than in live classrooms because you feel like you're just you're literally just like in her bedroom or something and you're like I have no lifeline I have nobody to message to help because I'm just here and I'm just you know stuck with this error message that I can't figure out um, and I'm the instructor. So um, I had this recently when I was, at, I forget what workshop I was teaching, but I was doing a remote workshop and the very first document that they knit wouldn't knit for some arcane reason and it knitted the day before. Um, and it was not the experience, like I really try to like make people be able to knit right away and then we kind of go through and make slides together and it didn't work. Um, and I still don't exactly know what happened. There was some installation problem on the cloud setup. It was all complicated, but um, it's, it's hard to get over those when they happen. Um, but I've kind of learned to just like take a deep breath. Everybody's like experiencing this even more so now, cause we're all on zoom all the time and things are happening. So I found that people are extremely uh, wonderful and nice. Um, I also recently did a workshop where they made me use Microsoft teams instead of zoom. Um, and, uh, it was the beginning of a two day workshop, <laughs> two days. <laughs> Um, and uh, my screen share didn't work. So my partner who is at our studio on the customer success side had to screen share my slides and had to increment them every time. So I had a hand signal <laughs> for incrementing my slides for two full days um, and that was awful. It was horrible and you'll never get me to use Teams again <laughs> after that. 
need time zones are another challenge. Um, so for me, like last spring, um, and so even this next quarter where I'll be teaching, I can't do synchronous or I don't, I don't believe I should do synchronous learning because too many of my students are in different time zones and I don't want to give the ones who have a class at 2 p.m. a better advantage than the ones at you know, three in the morning. <laughs> um, so for me, I had to switch to a model where I, um, I'm coding, like I, I you know, I, or I ended up using Panacto. So there's a screen, um, you can see me like coding and doing stuff in the screen. You can see my face in another, <laughs> like a smaller screen. And then there's a, um, like a log of that kind of bookmarks the, the video. Um, so it's something that people have to watch and um, I did that this last um, spring and it worked out really well, except for two or three students who were really quiet, kind of introverted, were kind of scared to, you know, like the students that I could, I could catch in a, um, in a live session, a synchronous session or in person. Um, it's, I, I still haven't found a good way to kind of capture those, um, those guys. Um, but it's, yeah, it's an interesting challenge. Um, yeah, and I'll go ahead and um, uh, the kind of final final question. It's it's um, it's two questions. One is um, about any um, resources, institutions, agencies that support people who are interested in our education. If you had specific recommendations for those, um, and then the second question is maybe a little more personal to you. What's next for you in terms of like our curriculum development and education? Like, what do you want your next um, our teaching pedagogy related project to be? I can go. Um, I <laughs> I am um, really focused recently on trying to make uh, our markdown easier to teach and learn. Um, so I'm working a lot uh, with if, if anyone has seen the more recent uh, development version of the R Studio IDE. We have a virtual uh, visual markdown editor now, which I think is going to be um, really powerful to empower students to kind of, you know, have this like what you see is what you get experience when they're typing. Um, so I'm working on, um, you know, kind of new materials for the R Studio, um, uh, our Markdown website to kind of help like people on board with the visual Markdown editor first. Um, and then also I'm working with uh, my one of my colleagues, Tom Mock, who's at R Studio, um, and we are revamping the our Markdown education site to include a lot of stuff that we think uh, is sort of like the hidden curriculum um, of our Markdown. So I think a lot of times what at least I did previous to joining our studio was I taught with our Markdown, but I never really taught our Markdown because it was kind of complicated. So I kind of was just like, just use it, just run chunks and just knit. And I never really explained much about like knitter chunk options and YAML options and output formats and output options. I didn't talk about all of that stuff. Um, and so I'm trying to build out an online resource uh, to help people uh, to be able to figure that out because I think there's a lot of our Markdown users that um, at least come into my workshops called Advanced R Markdown Workshops and people are like, what are knitter chunk options? What, what are these words that you're using? And I'm like, all right, <laughs> we have not like made that clear enough to people. It's it's complicated and there's, there's a lot of variability in uh, what people are coming in with. So we're going to try to kind of level the playing field a lot. So we're really excited about that stuff. So that'll be like in the next three to six months. Yeah, so I don't know that I have a, a good answer to the, the first question that was asked in terms of resources. Um, but in terms of what I'm uh, working on next, I have kind of a, a suite of, of shiny apps that, that I've developed to kind of teach statistical inference. And I'm hoping to expand on that in part because I'm kind of moving into a new challenge uh, in this in this new role that I'm going to be taking um, as an assistant professor because I'm going to be the, the main statistician that's in, kind of in charge of the undergrad curriculum. And I am told that I will kind of be in charge of a team of adjuncts um, that teach a lot of, um, of the intro stats courses. And so I, I'm probably not going to be to, able to rely on the fact that the adjuncts themselves will know R. Um, and so I think it may, might take a while before I can fully introduce R into the intro curriculum. Um, so I'm kind of trying to think about ways that um, 
I can still leverage the power of R um, to, to bring that into the classroom, but to do so in a way that the instructors themselves don't have to actually do the programming and, and know, um, know how to use R. Um, so yeah, kind of planning to expand that repertoire of, of shiny apps that I've been working on. So for resources, um, I really recommend not framing, like when you're asking for resources, I don't recommend framing it as I'm looking for our resources for our, or our education. I would instead frame it as I'm looking for resources to facilitate um, open science and reproducibility <laughs> and that sort of thing. Because I think that um, at least for the folks who have funding to, to hand out, like that, that kind of hits the, the right tone. And it really is a huge service to science, right? To do things that are reproducible. Um, it, I mean, like I, I, it's a massive like revolution and transformation to kind of, you know, like anyone can be a coder, right? Like I, like I see coding now as kind of just a different like language, like you, you write, like I, a long time ago, I did an MFA in writing and like even learned how to teach writing, but it's actually really similar to coding, right? Like it's, it's like, it, it takes a while and you iterate <laughs> a little bit and you kind of keep on going. So, so framing as open science um, and then thinking about those kind of critical thinking skills that we've been talking about today, like that, if you're looking at an education grant, potentially you could, you know, go for an education grant and bring in those concepts of critical thinking, you know, computational thinking, there's a whole thread on that um, as well. Um, so, so different things like that, that might be useful. Um, and, oh yeah, and then for next, or for future things, so one thing that like that's been a project for mine for like one or two years is to to again and I already mentioned some of this like to develop better kind of intro application based um, resources for learning R but like hidden within you know research questions so it's like how can you learn R without realizing that you're doing it um, <laughs> uh, so so working I mean we'll we'll see we'll see that where that goes but I'm also really excited just to continue to kind of. I feel like we need to have better curations of other stuff that's happening. So um, like on the GIS side, there's some awesome work by Lovelace, but then um, this other group just developed this really amazing toolkit to do that, to focus on like front end, like all the, um, the kind of, yeah, like the interactive visualizations piece of it. Um, and so it feels like, and I've seen a few, you know, blog posts that will just have a bullet list of all these things. But um, I think that like something like that, we need to get better curation surface or service for all the different um, tutorials so that um, people can figure out what works for best for them. Great. Well, thank you guys. Um, yeah, thank you so much to our panelists. That was really, really Awesome. I think actually the title I put on the meetup was correct. Like it was inspiring. Um, I want to thank also my fellow R ladies, uh, the board of Chicago's here. And also this meetup was co-hosted with R ladies East Lansing. So I'd like to thank them and the people that uh, came out from East Lansing and just everyone for being um, part of this community. Um, and yeah, so the, we have the room for, you know, a good chunk of more time if people want to stick around and uh, there were I know there were a couple of questions I um, didn't get to and so um, I'd love to just like discuss those casually or people you know have have specific things they want to say to the panelists. Um, otherwise yeah thank you so much for coming out guys. Uh, thank you so much on behalf of East Lansing too. Thank you. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people are heading out. So I don't know. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I'll I'll be around. Um